Hi, Ral Pal here, and welcome to my show, The Journeyman, where I travel to the nexus of macro, crypto, and the exponential age of technology. Now, this is a special, and I know you like these. They tend to get a lot of views. Um, it's really, again, my framework for understanding crypto. It's part of the Festival of Learning on Real Vision. At Real Vision, we've been passionate educators of all of you about all financial markets, all economies, how to invest, how to trade. We've got courses set up for you. We have things like the Festival of Learning to teach you. And we've been teaching you about crypto since day one, since we first launched. And we said, listen, this is important. So here is my piece for the Festival of Learning that I'm specially releasing here on YouTube. Now, I want you to realize that this is just some of the work that we do at Real Vision. The Festival of Learning, if you join that and if just click on the link below, will give you a lot more nuance from some of the greatest minds in the space. So please come and join us for that. It's free. So you'd be crazy if you don't educate yourself. You can't just trust me because I've produced a great set of charts you'll see coming. It's a pretty killer presentation. I've got to give it. But I want you to learn from others. I want you to go to realvision.com and just sign up and enjoy the Festival of Learning. It's pretty straightforward and you will get a lot more out of it. Also, while you're watching this, do me a favor. I know you like these videos. Please put it in the comment section. Also, please subscribe to the channel and hit the like. I'm trying to grow the channel. The more I grow the channel, the better guests I can get. Um, and it also makes me feel good. Because um, if not, I'm shouting into the dark. Anyway, enjoy the piece and I'll talk to you afterwards. Join me, Raoul Pal, as I go on a journey of discovery through the macro, crypto, and exponential age landscapes. In The Journeyman, I talk to the smartest people in the world so we can all become smarter together. Hi, everyone. Now, as ever, when I do a presentation like this, I'm speaking on behalf of not Real Vision, but of myself, Ralph Alf, from Global Macro Investor, and also from Exponential Age, the asset management firm that I have a crypto fund of funds that a lot of this research is from. So you'll see XPAM charts in here, just so that you know. Now, to set this up, you're all here for the Festival of Learning. And it's all generally about crypto and how we look at crypto and macro together to give us what we're looking for. And I'm trying to teach you how I look at this. And there's a lot in this. There's going to be a lot of charts to run through. Um, but I think it will give you a very cohesive picture. And what I want to get across to you today, this is the biggest macro opportunity of all time. I've basically dedicated a lot of my life to this trade now. And many, many others in the space, particularly macro players, have basically just given up trading other instruments and just gone towards crypto because the world driven by the everything code is basically all one trade, the debasement of currency by the central banks. And therefore, you want to own the best performing asset. And if the world is that simple, it really does make things much easier for us. Now, this is not for everybody. Not everybody wants to take the kind of risks, but this will give you a very good idea of why this is the biggest macro trade of all time. Now, when I first wrote about it in GMI back in 2012 or 13, I said it then. And I stupidly should have just dropped everything and just done this one trade, but I didn't. Um, but really, I've been in it full time since 2020. You know, the sell off in 2022 was the opportunity I was looking for to add to the trade. You know, I don't believe that if you've got a long term view, you should really try to trade around it. You should just keep compounding. Um, but others think differently to that. And I don't know what I'll do this time around. I'll probably take some lifestyle chips off and continue to run the trade. This trade is the biggest macro trade of all time. And it's not just about this cycle. It probably goes into 2030 and maybe well beyond that. So it's a big one. So anyway, pay attention, everybody. I'm going to start to go through the charts of why this is the biggest macro trade in history. Firstly, I'm going to start with the everything code. The everything code is the proprietary um, thesis that we built a global macro investor that we actually now run our portfolio for XPAM, you know, investing in the very best hedge funds. We use this everything code as the basis. And it's the one where I discover 
that the debasement of currency is kind of everything <clears throat> and how it's very cyclical and it's understandable and forecastable as far as we can tell. Obviously, things can change. Nothing is a pure, you know, perfection. But I think this is right and it seems to be proving itself out right. So firstly, we observe that over time, the trend rate of GDP growth has been falling in the United States and all around the world. Current trend rate of GDP growth is about 1.75%. Why is it falling? If you remember, trend rate of GDP is driven by three key factors. One, population growth. Two, productivity growth. Three, debt growth. So let's address these three factors. Firstly, let's have a look at productivity. Productivity has been declining over time as the workforce has been aging, and that lowers the trend rate of GDP. Debt, on the other hand, has been rising. But what we find is that household debt growth actually stopped in 2008 because the banks just stopped lending to people, so it's just harder to accumulate debt. Um, also, corporates have also been paying off debt and have really not been growing as fast as GDP. But really, a lot of the jet debt growth is now driven by the central banks, as we all know. Currently, the US is running massive deficits and is financing it by issuing yet more debt. And we'll come on to that in a minute. But the key thing here, the thing that drives everything for the everything code and the world around us, the return on assets, the inflation, everything is driven by demographics. So here's the working age population, aged 15 to 64, trend rate of growth. It's been declining over time as the population ages. Those people are less productive. The older you get, the less productive you are. They had borrowed debts in their early years and now are debt tapped out. So this explains a lot. And I've talked a lot about this on Real Vision in the past. But we can also project forwards. And if you remember my piece about the retirement crisis, I've been introducing this chart for a while, which is the labor force participation rate versus the births deaths rate. Uh, sorry, this is the births rate going forwards by 14 years. And obviously the birth rate drives how many people in the, in the labor force over time. And it suggests that participation of the labor force should continue to fall over time. Now, we've had some pickup as um, part-time workers have come back into the workforce because people don't have enough money. And we'll see some of that too. But over time, we're going to see the labor force participation rate falling because the replacement of new people in the population is not as much as people leaving the workforce. And that is the problem that slows economies. It's affected Japan, now affecting China, South Korea, Taiwan, and most of Europe. So anyway, that is the mega trend, but this mega trend has some special qualities. When you strip everything out, and I keep saying demographics is everything, you find that the labor force participation rate is exactly mirrored by US government debt as a percentage of GDP. So what it says is as the less people in the labor force, the economy slows, but there's all of the services to pay for for the old people. The government debt increases. That correlation is stunning, and that is an incredibly powerful chart to understand the world we live in today, why governments keep issuing debt, and eventually, why they end up having to print money to solve it. It's all a function of population. So what they do with that debt is they add liquidity into the system. That's the debasement of currency that I've talked about. And you can see the correlation between Fed net liquidity and the US government debt as a percentage of GDP. They're basically the same thing. Yes, the scaling's different, but overall, the trend is the same. So they're using liquidity to pay for the growth in debt by debasing the currency. It's called financial repression. The other stark thing that we found in the Everything Code is actually the real mechanism is that most of the government debt increase is just paying interest on existing debts. 
they're not actually borrowing a lot more to invest in the economy. It's basically servicing of old debts. And so there is a very strong correlation between um, the interest payments from the previous cycle and then the liquidity for this cycle. So i.e. they issue new debt, it comes up for renewal, they ha they've already been issuing new debt again this cycle, so to pay for the interest payments from the last cycle, they debase the currency via the Fed li liquidity, so they're increasing liquidity into the system. Now look at that curve, that's the, that's the expected path here, driven by the interest payments from the pandemic debt, which was a huge increase in debt. Now, this debt keeps compounding, obviously, because you're adding debts on top of debts on top of debts on top of interest payments. So I don't expect it to just play out fully like this, but we should expect a big increase in liquidity going forwards, and that's crucial to the theory. You see, look at that trend of total liquidity. Think of it, again, in a different world. That is the ongoing trend of debasement of currencies. That when you debase the currency, gives you an optical illusion that asset prices are rising. So this chart of the NASDAQ versus the total liquidity index shows how correlated they are. It's actually 97.5% correlation. Now, the NASDAQ actually outperforms this because it's a sec secular trend. But this debasement explains almost all of the movements of all assets over time which is why everything is so correlated. Yes, some things lead, some things lag, but this is the crucial chart to understand. The answer to the demographics is more debt. The demographics is causing a slower um, economy. And to get over that, they issue more liquidity, debase the currency to pay for it. That makes asset prices rise. This is the everything code, and it's really important. You see... Most people don't understand that this is the global liquidity index from all the major central banks. It's growing at an 8% annualized rate. Now, once you add in global inflation, and let's call global inflation about 4%, you've got a 12% hurdle rate for any investment. Now, that's pretty staggering because if you think about the S&P 500, it does about 12% a year. So basically, you're not getting ahead. By doing it, your savings aren't accruing future value, just present value. This 12% hurdle rate is a huge problem for people if you don't understand it. You are basically getting poorer if you don't hit your 12%. So if you're just investing in bonds and think it's a good idea to get the 5% interest, well, you're actually, your future self is getting poorer. So when we look at global equities, versus the total liquidity index. We've seen that since 2008, from the crisis, when they started printing money, it collapsed, but then it's been sideways ever since. So they've basically offset the balance sheet, but done no better. And if we took it from 2007, before the big printing started, it's actually lost 2.54% a year versus the debasement. So you've been poorer for owning equities generalized global equities than, um, than the debasement itself. So that's cost you money. When we talk about crypto, I use the chance of Bitcoin here because Bitcoin has the longest price history. It too is stunningly correlated with global liquidity. You see, Bitcoin has an 87.5% correlation, not as high as the NASDAQ, because as you can see, it's the periods of outperformance that lowers that correlation. When we start to get, you know, full kind of mania, you know, crypto mania cycles that you get in this exponential asset because it is a much more exponential curve um, because it's driven by tech adoption. Um, and we'll come on to that in a second as well. But you can see that liquidity is the driver of Bitcoin plus technology. But when I look at Bitcoin versus global liquidity, it's outperforming the debasement by 105% a year. I mean, that's a staggering difference versus global equities, which are not doing anything at all and are probably negative. That's a huge, huge difference 
in your future purchasing power, which is why this is such an important asset. And again, I'll come on to more of this in a bit. But we've ascertained that technology stocks are in a secular bull market. They're 97.5% correlated, but they've been rising very well over time. However, when you look at NASDAQ versus Bitcoin, this is a crucial chart. So NASDAQ is the best performing equity market in the world, essentially. But when you look at it versus Bitcoin, since this period of de debasement, NASDAQ has underperformed by 99.93%. Just wrap your head around that. And it doesn't stop. It's underperforming by 45% a year. And as you can see, we're going to break to new lows and this chart will just continue as Bitcoin and crypto eat the world. It's something I call the supermassive black hole. I look at Bitcoin charts versus every asset and they're all the same. They're all down 99.9 something percent. And then I look at relative values between Bitcoin and Ethereum or Bitcoin and Solana. And that's where you get to choose what you think the fastest horse is. And that's why I chose Solana this cycle. But basically, crypto is the supermassive black hole, the asset that appreciates faster than anything else and on a risk-adjusted basis too. So what's driving this? Well, what's driving this is obviously the debasement of currency, but why the other 105% excess returns versus that? Well, it's this chart. This is starting the internet at 5 million IP users and crypto at 5 million wallets active wallets. So yes, I know that they're, neither of them are perfect measures, but I'm not looking for perfection. I'm looking for understanding. And what we saw is the internet, which was the fastest adoption of technology the world had ever seen, it grew at 76% a year and then slowed down after year eight to 43% a year. Crypto has been growing at 137% a year. It's now at 516 million users versus 187 million of the internet at the same stage. And then what we did is assume that crypto just slows down its growth to the same as the internet. I don't think that's going to happen. I think it'll be faster. But it gets by um, 2025, the end of 2025, we get to 1.1 billion users. So that'll be double the pace that the internet grew. And because this is a network, and the tokens are at your participation in the network, they go up a lot. It's as simple as that. It's Metcalfe's law. So when you've got the biggest technological trend of any asset class in all of history, you're going to make a lot of money if that trend continues. This is why it's the biggest macro trend of all time. But it goes on. If we look out further using the internet adoption growth, and we slow down the trend rate of growth of crypto to the same as the internet going forwards, we get to 4 billion users by 2030. That's half the world's population. Now, will this be perfect? It's been pretty perfect so far. I've been showing this chart for five years now, but let's assume not. Either way, these numbers are simply staggering. And that's why you get that log chart of Bitcoin over time. Because it's the adoption curve is what you're seeing, which is why the sell-offs, even though they, they sound terrifying, down 75%, are just blips in the overall trend. And over time, it just keeps compounding growth. You see, to show how starkly this compounds growth, this chart um, of all of the asset markets since 2011, I think is, is hilarious. So you've got the usual NASDAQ, blah, blah, blah. So we can look, ignore the top three for a second. NASDAQ, 17%, beating the debasement, that 12% number, and compounded 800% since 2011. That's a fucking good investment. What a great investment the NASDAQ's been. Then we go up. Look at the top, Bitcoin. Bitcoin, every three years, is the worst performing asset ever. The next three years, in a row, it's the best performing asset in the world. And even with the drawdowns, those scary drawdowns that everybody hates, it's compounded 
20 million percent returns. Since we started talking about Bitcoin on Real Vision in 2014, it's up 450,000%. Its annualized return is 139%. Uh, that, that's mind blowing, right? We've never, ever in history been given an asset like this. But when you go out the risk curve a bit to newer crypto, getting up the risk curve, getting up the adoption curve, well, in 2016, out comes Ethereum. Out of the gate, monster returns. Huge drawdowns. Compounding returns, 364,000%. Annualized at 149%, which is better than Bitcoin. Solana came last cycle. Again, came out of the gate, fell 94%. What are the compounded returns? 7,713%, which is 200% a year. Right, so there is no asset class in all of history that's ever performed like this, even with the drawdowns. This is why I keep saying to people, you just want to buy and hold them. And if you can make the right switch amongst the big ones as the next big network gets adoption, you'll make even more compound returns. Right, this is the biggest gift we've ever been given as investors. And it's the biggest macro trade of all time. Let's go back to the risk reward topic. Here's Urian Timmer's chart that I've stolen from him, um, which is on the left is all of the bubbles of risk rewards of assets and how they look. Pretty typical. And this is how asset allocators think about it. But when you add in Bitcoin, you end up with a massive blank page with at the very top right this fucking alien risk reward, which is Bitcoin. Crypto is a complete alien in, in terms of performance and risk reward. This chart includes the drawdown of 2022. So you see, again, I keep saying it's a gift and people still don't really understand what a gift it is. It's something unlike anything we've ever had in history. And it gives us a hell of a chance to make money. So to sum up what the biggest macro trade of all time is, it's crypto going from 2.7 trillion where we are today to let's say 12 trillion by the end of this cycle and onto 100 trillion within 10 years. And you've got to understand this would be the fastest accumulation of an asset class in all recorded history in the shortest period of time. It'll have driven the highest returns of any asset class in all of recorded history in the shortest period of time. In fact, in any period of time. And it will be the fastest accumulation of wealth the world has ever seen in the shorter period of time. If we go and generate 90, 90 odd trillion in wealth in the next 10 years, to put that number in perspective, because we're all getting bored of such big trillion numbers, that is, the S&P 500 is $50 trillion. That is the accumulated worth of all the companies that have succeeded and failed and grown over time, driven by the US economy, it, over the last 100 years. It's $50 trillion. It's double that. And you're going to do it in 10 years. It's a global wealth shock on a scale never seen before in history. It's like all of the baby boomers coming in and saving all at the same time in 10 years, their entire life savings, plus all of China coming in from the WTO as that opened and the wealth that generated, plus India opening up, plus all the Russians added together and probably doubled. Right, this is the scale of what could happen here. Assume Raoul is a moron. It's always a good thing to do. Maybe I'm wrong. Discount me by 50%. Discount me by 75%. It's still at 25 trillion. It's one of the largest increases in global wealth the world will have ever seen. This is why it's the big macro opportunity. This is why so many of my friends and colleagues, famous macro people, have just walked out of the old world into the new world. 
because it's like, this is the big one. Macro people look for the big trade. You know, it was the subprime crisis, all of that. But the returns coming out of this space dwarf all of those opportunities added together. Gone are the days where an incredible macro year would be Paul Tudor Jones up 100%. People in crypto get that regularly. That's a pretty lackluster year. And in fact, you expect to see several hundred percent. So look, it's mind-blowing. Anyway, that's enough of the dream speak. Let's get on to the liquidity cycle and how it's driven, because you need to understand that. So liquidity is cyclical. As I explained before, here's the chart, the dot chart of the um, correlation between global liquidity and Bitcoin. Very tight, 87% correlation. So we, we know that. We also know that we can construct a global macro investor, a lead for liquidity. It exactly caught the low in Q4 2022. That's when we kind of doubled down and went super long technology and crypto because that was the bottom. That's when everybody else was getting max bearish. We got max bullish using liquidity. Um, the only other person who really uses it in the same way is Mike Howell, um, and he does some great work as well. But we've really gone down the macro crypto. We have more macro crypto understanding of global macro investor than certainly anybody else in the world and how this all links together. And I won't show all of it now, but I'll show you some. So that was the low that we chose in Q4 2022, all catalogued in GMI, all catalogued in Real Vision Pro Macro. You know, we do everything out in the open. So this is not us saying, oh, yeah, we bought it. Wink, wink. No, we did. It's all catalogued. Anybody who's subscribed to those services know well what we did. And since then, it's been 304%. Now, what's interesting is the Everything Code helped us understand how to forecast liquidity into the future. Again, we're not expecting perfection, but you're expecting the cycles to play out. So here's the ISM with a 15-month lead and the global liquidity. Why the ISM leads is because it's actually inverted there. It's because the business cycle keeps repeating because of the debt refi cycle I've talked so much about. So what we are is it confirms some of the other charts I showed you before. We should start to see global liquidity pick up going into election years. That is very typical. You know, we've got the commercial real estate to deal with. We've got how the hell are they going to keep issuing bonds to pay the interest when bond yields aren't coming down? Something's got to give and liquidity is going to give it to them. So we know it's coming, we just don't know how. It could be in a new mechanism, which is the Basel IV agreement, which allows, which forces banks to hold more treasuries. There can be a number of ways we do this. We will also maybe see a massive release of the Treasury General account over the election period. That's possible too. We don't know where it's going to come from. It's unlikely to come from straight quantitative easing because everybody knows what that is now. So they'll find ways of obscuring what they're doing, which is making you poorer. They're basically taxing you every year by about 8% by devaluing and debasing the currency. In fact, the Fed have actually been debasing faster than others at some like 15% a year if you just use the balance sheet. But anyway, let's use that global number. We're also starting to get the rate cutting cycle coming in. Now, rate cutting doesn't actually go into the liquidity, but it's part of the things that show you that the central banks want to move towards liquidity. We've just started the cutting cycle. Started in Latin America with Brazil. We're starting to see it across Europe. We're starting to see it elsewhere. And the next two years will be the feature of cutting rates. Sure, maybe rates don't go as low as they were before. Maybe there's only a few rate cuts. If you remember, or many of you won't, but 1994 was the bond market blow up. The Fed raised rates a lot. Everybody blew up. Banks went under, very similar to 2022. 1995, everybody expected the Fed to cut rates several times. They actually only cut them twice, 75 basis points in two goes, and then went on hold for years, essentially. Now, most pundits in the market say, well, if they don't cut rates as much as the market was expecting, it's going to be terrible. Answer was, back then, the stock market rose 150% before super accelerating on a rate cut in 1998, and we got the NASDAQ bubble at the end of that. 
So I don't see any issue. Markets like stability. And if they cut rates a bit, because J-PAL needs to, they're going to have to sub figure some other way of doing the interest payments, of paying the interest payments. And what will happen is markets will continue to rise. It's liquidity. Okay. So let's forecast out liquidity a bit further using the everything code. So we saw that chart before. This is ISM going forwards. Last time I showed you the ISM versus liquidity, but here's ISM going forwards, which says the business cycle is going to rise. This is why currently cyclical stocks, commodities are rising because the ISM is starting to pick up. But we can also forecast it out and it gives us a peak in global liquidity in um, September 2024. So this year we'll see a peak. Don't worry, a peak is not a peak of markets. This is a year over year rate of change. We don't end up getting to negative liquidity until December 2025. So this is why I think this cycle runs between now and it started in 2022, sometime in 2025, somewhere probably towards the latter. And normally the crypto markets end in December, maybe it comes a bit sooner. We'll have to be on alert for that. But basically, this is how we see liquidity playing out. Again, don't expect perfection. I'm not expecting to be perfect, but it'll give you a pretty decent idea. You don't need a massive liquidity cycle either. You don't need 2020 to drive these things up. You just need liquidity to be positive and stay positive for markets to work their magic. Now, those forecasts, if I use the log channel of global liquidity, using the everything code forecast doesn't look unreasonable. Doesn't look unreasonable at all. Now. It might not get to two standard deviations. Maybe it's one standard deviation like it got to in 2017. Remember the crypto market then? That was la-la land. 2013, one standard deviation, a complete wild crypto market. So again, you don't need the massive liquidity. You just need liquidity. And so that's where we think it might go. Let's see how it plays out. That corresponds with the log channel in Bitcoin, obviously. And that would give us something like a forecast of around 270,000 by the end of this year. Again, please don't hang on to my forecast. Say, Ral Pal forecast 270,000 this year. That's not what I'm trying to do here. What I'm trying to do is contextualize stuff for you and say, listen, between now and the end of the year, it's going up a decent amount. Is it 150,000? Is it 250,000? Is something in the middle? I don't know, and I don't really care. And nor should you. People get too hung up on forecasts when this asset is just going up over time. Anyway, it means this year will be a very strong year. And we can plug in some forecasts. And I don't like giving these out to people because people, again, will take this out of perspective. They'll say, Ral Pal forecast $400,000 Bitcoin headline. That's bullshit. What I'm saying is using our model, we see significant continued upside into 2025 where then liquidity starts falling. And so sometime around the second half of the year, we will see a, a topping pattern in, in Bitcoin and therefore crypto. And it suggests that it should be strong. Even if you halve my targets, not targets, halve the analysis that comes out of the model, that's still a great year. That's my point. Please do not tell me that I'm forecasting $400,000 Bitcoin I'm not going to take that because people deal with it irresponsibly and that's not the right thing. I'm just saying it's going up a lot. Also, Fed liquidity is the driver of the ETH Bitcoin cross, which is a proxy for altcoin season. Now, it's very interesting because we're now coming into the halving. And it was roughly at this point Back in 2020, the ETH started bottoming versus Bitcoin and then took a while to base and then went up like a rocket ship for the entire next year. I managed to capture that entire trend. And it's very normal for crypto summer, uh, spring, for Bitcoin to outperform. And then as we come into crypto summer that we're transitioning into now, ETH starts to outperform Bitcoin. 
This is a terribly unpopular thing to say because people say, well, ETH is dead. It's a dead chain. It's not working, blah, 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 blah. Just wait. Have patience. You'll see. Will it outperform Solana? I very much doubt it. Solana's earlier in the adoption curve, so it means the percentage changes are larger. So that's how I see it with that. You can see the start of crypto spring, which was the breakout of this pattern and the slight acceleration. That's as we're getting to warmer days of spring, as it were. But really, summer happens when you break the previous all-time high in market cap and things go utterly bananas. So this is ex-Ethereum. So this is the rest of the space really starting to accelerate. And sometime in 2024, we will hit all-time high market cap of altcoins, and this chart will go truly into the banana zone, which I know is a very fun time. People lose their fucking minds in this period, and I'm urging you to remember my rules about don't use leverage, keep top three, top five market cap tokens if you are going to go out the risk curve, do it with 10% of your capital or less. Just be careful out there. Don't fuck this up. This is a gift, but you can screw it up by getting greedy, getting FOMO, and doing stupid shit you shouldn't do. Just don't do that. If you want to have some fun, catch an old coin season, do it with your 10%. Who knows? You might make a 10x on it. Chances are you'll end up with a bunch of embarrassing stuff in your wallet that goes to zero over time. That's the way it works. But your ETH, Solana, Bitcoin, I'll do just fine. Okay, let's talk about Crypto Summer, just in a very simplistic terms. Here's the chart of the seasons. So spring is green. We had a great spring this year. Summer is when a lot of the gains start to happen. Fall was tricky last time around. We got a stunted cycle. If you remember that kind of double toppy style thing was highly unusual. 2017, 2013 were more typical, obviously, of the fall season. And so we don't know how this one's going to play out. I think it plays out more like 2013, 2017, but it's all assessing the odds as we go. But right now, this is the easy year, the summer. So we should just be able to set it, forget it, and let the gains accumulate. And then very soon, very soon, like in the next month, next month and a half, we will start to hit the banana zone. And this is what happens when you hit the banana zone. Things get absolutely wild, which is the really magical part of why this is the greatest macro trade of all time, is this part. And it's coming. Will it look the same as others? Who knows? Some have been absolutely crazy. Others were more difficult, like the last cycle. But... That's usually what happens when we hit altcoin season from summer and then into fall. Things get really, really exciting. Now, at Exponential Age Asset Management, I won't talk much about that, is we actually build a whole portfolio allocation of where we want to be on the risk curve using lots of factors that Julian Bissell has put together from the everything code, valuation percentiles, volatility, uh, where we are in alt season, different measurements of all of this these nine different things, and then give it a total score. Right now, we're at 9.2 out of 10. So almost at max risk-taking. But we're not there yet because we haven't got, um, we're not fully into summer. But that, that day will come and we allocate to managers accordingly. This kind of risk scoring is just the summary of what I've been talking about, is right now, this is the time to take risk. Don't use leverage. Be careful what you own. Have fun out there and do it right. So Hopefully, what I've done here is try and teach you why this matters, why you should, in this festival of learning, listen to other people and learn some skills, how not to fuck this up, which is crucially important because you're being given a gift, why it's such a big gift, how ridiculous the returns have been over time and are likely to be going forwards. Obviously, there's no guarantee, but I don't see anything changing. How the everything code plays into this, how the, the refinancing of debts every four years creates a four-year cycle that happens to correspond with the Bitcoin halving cycle and 
the US presidential election cycle, how that breaks down into different seasons, how liquidity plays into this and how demographics play into it, and how liquidity is being used to debase your currency, making your future self poorer. And then I've shown you how crypto fits into your portfolio to offset not only the debasement, it's a life raft for your asset, but it also happens to be an asset that goes up more than any other asset of all. And this is not funny internet money. It's actually driven by macro. It's driven by the business cycle, like all other assets are. It's driven by the liquidity cycle, which happens to be, we think, pretty forecastable. Yes, it gives some crazy numbers for performance. And again, they're not my targets. I don't really care where it gets to in price because the next cycle, it's going to be higher and the cycle after that, higher. Even if the returns lower over time, maybe they don't. There's a big thesis out there that, that we will get tapering returns and the, the log channel of Bitcoin is the wrong way to look at it. I don't see any evidence of that in the NASDAQ. That's been a powerful log channel for a very long time now. I don't see any reason why you need to get lower returns, but maybe we do. I'll worry about that when we get to 4 billion users. So in a nutshell, this space is going from 2.7 trillion in market cap. It'll get to something like 10, 12 trillion in this cycle. It'll then have an inevitable bear market, whether it's as big as the previous bear markets or not. We can't tell. We've now got new participants putting in their 401k money every two weeks. Maybe they all panic out. Nobody knows. But it doesn't matter because those sell-offs are the opportunity. If you can, take some lifestyle chips off. Protect yourself in the great crazy days uh, later this year. And then you're fine. Then you can run it if you want to. You don't have to. I will. And then you can add into the bear market when everybody's scared because you've got a plan. This is the plan. This is the framework that you need to have confidence. So just keep going. Anyway, as I always say, good luck out there. The biggest macro trend of all time. Let's see if we can be part of this generation, this generating of wealth, the let's say 90 something trillion of wealth that's going to come. Because that will truly change your life and your family's life. All right, take care. Okay, well, I hope I got across to you all the things I was trying to explain in the video, how big this is, how not to fuck it up, how important this is. And again, I'm going to reiterate the don't fuck this up. Don't use leverage because it's a way for people to take your coins. Store your coins carefully. Don't let anybody else have them. I think most of the big exchanges are safe. but. To be extra safe, I don't really leave stuff on exchanges. It's all in cold storage. Yeah, it's a pain to set up, but once you do it, you feel safer. Then, don't FOMO into stupid shit because your friends are making money or you're seeing some bloke making money in a meme coin. If you want to do stuff outside of the three or four big crypto um, cryptocurrencies, then do it with 10% of your money. There you can have fun. There you can be a gambling, filthy degen. But don't, don't do that with the bulk of your assets because you think you're never going to get a chance. How are you going to grow your two grand? It will compound over time. Just trust me on this. And then you can play for the hundred X's or whatever you do. You will probably lose money in that, uh, in that 90% bucket. When I look at my own allocation, my own allocation is probably 1% um, memes and shit like that. Most of it is just straightforward and I don't use leverage. And even though I've used leverage over years, I don't want to use leverage in a market that is this volatile. Anyway, remember, this is just part of the education. Go to Real Vision, I beg you, realvision.com, and just smarten yourself up. Get Turn the information that you see into a world of knowledge and wisdom. And the Festival of Learning will help you do it. And if you're watching this after the Festival of Learning's taken place, well, you can watch the, the, the reruns of it there, plus all of the education that we've got on Real Vision. You can talk to the AI, ask it for questions of how to understand you know, the terms that people use, how to understand what liquidity is, how to understand all of this. It's all there for you. We've built it for you. 
Anyway, enjoy yourselves, get some education, and let's take advantage of the biggest macro opportunity of all time. Hey there, revolutionaries. To join a community sharing insights like you just watched, head over to realvision.com. There you will get unbiased insights and exclusive access to the very best, brightest, and biggest names in finance. Be a part of our community of lifelong learners. See you there.